You know, sometimes it's important to have the appropriate context if you're going to tell a good story, including a true story, right? Like how I came to write an article about the 1996 Anti-Terrorist and Effective Death Penalty Act. I've already told that story. It's elsewhere. I'll help you find it if you're interested. How about this story? I'm homeless on the street, someplace I go to eat. One day I'm there at the table with some people that are homeless talking about what's going on. And I start talking to them about things I used to do. They start talking to me about things they used to do. And I say I used to be a journalist. And among the things I used to do as a journalist was cover certain kinds of issues, including about crime. That I was an editor at a newspaper that covered crime, including crime involving acts of police brutality. One of the guys at the table says, you know what, they're putting together a commission that they asked the Department of Justice to investigate these acts, these police shootings that have been happening. Why don't you go down and talk to the Department of Justice and tell them you want to participate? Now this me and a couple of guys sitting at this table. And the way it worked out, these tables usually sat between 10 people. It's a big round table. About 10, maybe 12 of us sitting there, getting a meal. And you were able to do this two or three days a week. Right there, downtown Chicago. I was like, you know what? All right, I'm going to do that. Within a week, I'm actually on site at the Department of Justice office in another part of downtown Chicago with some papers I had printed out. There were two samples of writing, one of which was something that had already been submitted to Congress but had already been published as well concerning issues regarding uh, matters related to activism in another country, or rather an activist who had been shot and killed, but in the context of understanding that there was a need to investigate impropriety by public officials, including in connection with the banking sector, and then another piece that had not been published that was bringing up consideration of bond fraud, or rather fraud involving municipal bonds and other kinds of financial arrangements related to the municipality itself. The concern being that municipal financing may have something to do with police performance, which would impact the manners in which an encounter between a police officer and a person could escalate into fatal violence. I'm there on site in person handing them these reports. You see, does it make a difference? Does it make a difference if you know my motivation was because I'm sitting there with some people and they hear me talk about my experiences and I hear them talk about their experiences and there's other things I did at that time, by the way, including try to contact a lawyer about how they had been so-called employed to work some events and then just didn't get paid, right? And that wasn't very important, I guess, to say, hey, you used to know me. We used to be in community together. We used to have things in common. You say you have some reference points. I have some reference points. These guys actually need someone that has your qualifications in order to do your job. You know, if you don't feel like I'm worth getting back to, what about them? This was at their behest, actually, that I went down to the Department of Justice. Does it make a difference if that's the context? How about this? Right now, what am I looking at? I went to the Department of Justice in August, late August of 2016. What am I looking at right here? Page 18. On the page 17, 18 to 19, D, historical background of reform in Chicago. The Chicago Police Department has cycled in and out of the national consciousness almost since its inception. In the last several decades have been no exception. In 1968, images of CPD officers beating protesters at the Democratic National Convention were captured and broadcast on national television. A commission convened in the aftermath of the event found that the violence amounted to a police riot. No officers were prosecuted. In the 1980s and 1990s, a CPD detective, John Birch, and several officers under his command used severe interrogation tactics such as physical force, suffocations, and electric shocks to coerce confessions from predominantly black men living on Chicago's south and west sides. Birch was ultimately fired, and in 2008, decades after the abuse began, he was arrested on charges of perjury and obstruction of justice. He was convicted on all counts but was allowed to keep his pension from CPD and served only four and a half years in prison. Dot, dot, dot. John Birch, I remember that case. 
I remember specifically the media coverage. And you know, the ironic thing is the way this particular paragraph sets this up. A, a commission convened in the aftermath of the event found, but captured and broadcast on national television. It was also reported in the newspapers, just like the investigation and trial of John Birch. Now, as I recall, I personally only had an authorship while I was a newspaper editor in a specific manner related to the trial of John Birch, as well as the attendant campaign to end the death penalty that was successful. But every single article I wrote and all evidence that I even worked at that newspaper has been disappeared from me. And the people I used to work with refused to talk to me. And it's not because I said or did the wrong thing at the right time or the wrong time. It's because there was a particular political capital that somebody else decided to avail themselves of. See, when I was in Texas in 2017, I had need for my own reasons because I had been kidnapped under the auspices that I made people feel unsafe when I was trying to report child abuse and fraud at a domestic violence shelter. Around the same time, I was told that my effort left jurisdiction. There was a case that was filed in Chicago now, I'm not going to mention the details of that case. What I am going to mention is this right here, dated for January 13th, 2017, United States Department of Justice Civil Rights Division and United States Attorney's Office, Northern District of Illinois. This was the commission those men were talking to me about, and they recommended I go down in person an offer to assist. Did they already have a profile on me? No. Did they already have securities underwriting their financing, or rather, paying for the pensions of the people that they would be working with in the state's attorney's office in the city of Chicago or Cook County? Would that have had anything to do with the fact that I had been identified as having a need for medical treatment in entering the hospital emergency room the same day? That report about the Chicago pension systems was published. See, I was in another state by that time. I was in San Francisco, but the day I went to the emergency room and was entered for medical treatment in Chicago. They were publishing a report on the pension system. You know, the ironic thing is here, there's one mention of pension, but there are 37 additional mentions of suspension. The first one has to do with John Burge's pension fund, which he was allowed to receive. This is no coincidence. This is a complete disgrace and dishonor. It's that blatant. Now we are where we are. When am I going to get restitution for having my entire community disappear? See, those men I was sitting at the table with were not so dissimilar from the man I worked with who co-wrote the, uh, the article with me on the 1996 Anti-Terrorist and Effective Death Penalty Act specific to a case that was then pending in the city of Chicago regarding a man who was kidnapped by the FBI. How was it allowed to be acceptable to completely disappear me, slander me, steal my work that I put into the public realm as a journalist including in connection with being the editor of a publication that reported successfully in an award-winning publication on things like the trial of John Burge and how the trial of John Burge helped end the death penalty in Illinois, regardless of what my personal political perspective is then or now. How was it allowed to just disappear me 
and completely recast and overwrite my life? Did you literally agree to traffic me in connection with allowing for acts of fraud that had been set up connected to bonding associated with members of law enforcement while somebody else was governor in another state in and through Illinois and make sure that I was out of town in time for that deal to hit in Illinois so I could be entered into a hospital and have my entire life dispossessed of me and rewritten. See, we're more than 10 years now since that report came out. And in the meantime, I need to ask, what was written in my name in Streetwise newspaper January 13th of 1997, or rather 1999? What did by Charity Krause dated for January of, of 1997 say? Because I have a feeling I know what it is. It's probably connected to somebody else's understanding of justice. But rather than talking about criminal justice, or police brutality, I think it has to do with real estate, doesn't it? And a specific kind of real estate, doesn't it? Are you disappointed that I refused the conversion? Are you disappointed that I figured it out, that my life was supposed to be liquidated to launder the taxes associated with that specific charitable contribution to that specific faith-based organization so that you guys could meet your pension hedges? What did you really do about police brutality in Chicago since then? What did you really do about gun violence in Chicago since then? What did you really do about those toxic swap deals? What did you really do about those municipal bonds? What did you really do about the report that the former chief of police had about how morale on the job impacted the performance of police when they were actually out in the street. Am I going to find that in here? Am I going to find in here substantive critiques of how the former chief of the Chicago Police Department was submitting reports expressing his concerns with police morale? Because it makes one wonder, what do you mean by police morale? Were you upset because there were quotas put on law enforcement so that that acidization could circulate to the municipal employees and those that were availed of city services? Or did it have to do with a outlay that was expected to come later concerning <clears throat> commemorative coinage, right? And are you just pissed because you were expecting me to convert my gold to pay for all your pension scheme? And unfortunately, that didn't happen. You're damn right it didn't happen. It got cut off today, right? I'm owed justice. I'm owed justice and so were those men I was sitting at that table with at Catholic Charities in the summer of 2016 that had enough faith in themselves to say, you know what? Here's somebody we're breaking bread with. We're here. This is our lives. We have a right to be hurt. You didn't listen to them. You didn't listen to them when you acknowledged me and my skills being able to represent us and whatever you thought this was. You didn't acknowledge them when they got signed up to work a job and then they just didn't get paid. I'm sure their demographics are represented all over this report. But them as human beings, they're no more or less important apparently than I am. Or are they? Did you coin them? Did you coin those middle age and or retirement age African-American men that were homeless and on the streets with me at that meal that said I should go down to the Department of Justice and offer my skills in order to bring justice to the people of the city of Chicago and other people that would be impacted? Or were you more concerned with making your pension hedges?